What's good, everybody? It's Donnie B. Got the Beats. You live on the beat. If you ain't noticed, I'm experiencing technical difficulties here, man. I'm sitting back here with the with the with the, uh, the, the green giant back behind me instead of the, 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 the glorious city that I normally be on. But, you know, it is what it is. It's technical difficulties, and we in a technical era. So these things happen. We just got to roll with the punches, man. But that's neither here nor there. Look. I keep telling y'all, and I have told y'all, that I try to bring the best talent possible that I've ever come across to share with people in, in, the, in the world, right? And you also know, if you watch the beat, you know I got to give a glorious intro for all of my guests. So we're going to take this back for a second. For a second ago, 2015. Matter of fact, let me take a back a little bit further. 2014. My little my little brother, by the, by the way, just my little brother. I know I know Jamar since I was 12 years, 12, since he was 12, 13 years old. He got buried in California. I came out to experience this thing, and it was that marriage, that wedding between my brother Jamar and my beautiful sister Carmen that I it, it sold me. It said, you know what, you got to move to California because California, excuse me, is where it is. During that time, I came across this fella in the club. We were at supper. This is the time that I really remember this guy. We we're at supper night club. And if you, you LA cats know where supper is, supper ain't even open no more. But we was at supper. And we was in the VIP section because, you know, that's what, you know, me and the people that I know do. And this brother came strolling. He was a cool dude. But this dude's energy was uh, like, if you could think on a Richter scale of from zero to 10, this man was probably about like a thousand when he walked in the door. And I was like, who the hell is this guy, man? Like, who is he? You know what I mean? And, and then got to, got to know him. He's a cool brother. So when I actually moved out here, uh, you know, it, he kept the G, kept the funky, and uh, still a cool guy, still still a, a, a dope dude. But I wound up having to go back to DC for a little bit because my, my son was sick. When I moved back to, to, to LA, this brother came and, and scooped me up on the weekends in Thousand Oaks. And if, you, if you're familiar with the territory, Thousand Oaks is about a good, it feel like three hours away, but it's, it's really 45 minutes up the road. And this band would come up. Out of just and it was like, hey brother, it's cool. It is what we do. And I I I, I forever loved this guy just because of that. But not, it, it, who he is is an amazing person. That you know, I'm rambling. I, I just got nothing but good things to say, but I had to share the backstory. Anyway, this brother right here, a uber talented screenwriter, actor, comedian, and he's a comedian in real life, y'all. Not like he go on stage and be a comedian. Like this dude is funny about everything. <laughs> This is my brother, my good friend. Since I moved out here, this is my good friend. Like he's he's forever family to me. Kyle A. Jones, man. Kyle, how you doing, brother? Hey, man. Thank you so much for having me on the show, man. I'm honored to be a part of this. The beat podcast that's going live, man. I appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate you too. And again, I apologize because though, like I told you, I have my illustrious buildings in the back and it, it looked real big, but right now we got the green giant back behind me. So, you know, I apologize it's for all good. difficulties, but it is the beat is the beat nonetheless. Either way, I appreciate hey. having you on. 
we're going to keep it real. I mean, I know what the background usually looks like. I mean, look at mine. I'm keeping it real funky, okay? <laughs> bedroom funky. This is bedroom chic is what I'm serving today, okay? <laughs> you got, the, you got the, 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 the epitaph up at the top and everything. I love it. You know, I'm always trying to motivate and inspire. So if I can throw it in a little somewhere, then that's what we're doing today. You better... You better. <laughs> Sprinkling <laughs> salt bag, you know. I just want a salt bag. <laughs> How you doing tonight, though, man? Everything good with you, man? Yeah, man. I cannot complain, man. I'm absolutely blessed. Um, you know, this pandemic has been crazy because it's just one of those things that I think no one expected to go on this long. And the people that have been doing it and kind of thriving are the ones that are just simply surviving. And I think that it's just a testament to people's strength. And I'm blessed to be in the situation that I'm in, which is just constantly being favored by God to find opportunities to provide for myself and my family. So I can't complain, you know, it's not easy always, but you know, we're, we're here and that's all we can say. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, you ain't, you ain't, you ain't sitting up, slip to a can of oil, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, let's jump into this, man. Cause we are a little bit behind time. Uh, but again, hopefully you just bear, uh, fans bear with us, you know, uh, apologies for the technical difficulties, but this is going to be a long one because, you know, we get long winded and I love this dude and I'm not about to truncate anything this brother got to say. So <laughs> we about to keep it G and keep it funky, man. Let's start with this brother. Kyle. Who is Kyle? Talk to us. Tell us about Kyle? where you're from. So I am from Baltimore, Maryland. I am a God-loving, talented artist, is how I would describe myself. Um, I was raised by two great, talented, intel intelligent um, African-American parents uh, that strive to be in education and push that as the forefront to our lives with God being, you know, the number one thing. Um, I think that right now it's just been one of those things that I've been growing into the person that I've seen myself being. Mm. And that's really who I am because I'm, I've had moments of self-realization. I've had moments of inspiration and I've had moments of failure to an extent that I've turned that into a learning experience because I couldn't let that, you know, be my life. And I couldn't mm. let that be the place where I stay stagnant. Um, because that's just not who I want to be. And mm. that's not what I want my life to be. And in order to you know, really achieve those goals, I recognize that we have to be willing to get uncomfortable and we have to be willing to take certain risks. So I've become that risk taker. I've become that person that, you know, I, I'm still very hesitant to do things sometimes, but I, I've become that person who's kind of been in that mindset of, you know what, we need to just leap. We need to make this jump to kind of get to that next level because life will get us nowhere being scared. And, you know, who's got time for scared? We've seen a pandemic, you know, still here. So uh, an abundance of health and an abundance of wealth are what I'm constantly shooting for. Amen. And, 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 and like I said, let this duly be noted, too, that I know this guy. I know this guy. This is not like somebody, oh, I just don't, you know, like randomly met or whatever. I know this guy. And he literally lives this with exactly what he's saying. So I, I just want to put the little asterisk on that joint so that everybody understands that this is real, like what you're saying. So I appreciate that, man. I appreciate that. Thousand. Yeah, man. We're going to keep it 100 <laughs> at all times. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's switch up real quick. Thank you mm -hmm. for the the introduction. Growing up in Bmore, though, and you know, uh, first of all, let me ask you this because you know I'm from the D I'm from the DMV too. Mm -hmm. Didn't meet you there. I met you here. But mm -hmm. I want to ask you in Baltimore or Baltimore. Uh, hopefully, I said it right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do y'all call it Bmore? Because I know in PG County we call it Bmore. So do y'all say Bmore? Yeah, we do say Bmore. Um... We say be more, uh, just a lot of people that are from there, you know, you'll know by the way that they say it because it's Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a lot of T's, that, you know, we're not sitting there putting a lot of articulation on our T's. Now, me being the actor, wanting to be a little more, you know, articulate, articulate at times, you know, I make sure people know I'm from Baltimore. Yes, you know my city, you know, Baltimore. that type of thing. But yeah. real talk is Baltimore. You know, city to read, city to bleed. You know, we haven't been through it all. You know, so we've had some things to say, but we do use be more. 
And do, is it is it Doug or Doug? If you're from Baltimore, it's, it's gonna sound like Doug. <laughs> <laughs> I already knew the answer. I'm just trying to share that. You know? Yeah. Hey, look, I'm not gonna fail no Baltimore quizzes or nothing. But <laughs> as an actor, we are taught, you know, you have to break those regionalisms so that you don't sound like where you're from if you have a little accent or something. So. It's been tough because, you know, some people be like, you ain't from Baltimore. You don't sound like you from Baltimore. It's like, wait a minute. Let's not go there because I will run streets on you. Let's not do it. Word. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. I get it, too. I get it, too. Yeah. What, uh, it, it, I, you know, I got to ask you about Charm City Kings. I got to ask you, but I'm going I'm to wait till I'm going to serve that later. Like, say that for later in the conversation. Okay. Because, I, mm -hmm. I, man, I'm just going to talk about that later on for sure. Okay. Sure. Well, growing up in Baltimore, how was it? Was, was it was it uh, difficult for you? Can you describe what it was like for you to come up in Baltimore to to to, to uh, you know uh, traverse out? Because I know you you spent time at Howard University as well too, and then from Howard now you in the great you know the greater uh, LA area. Uh, could you describe what it was like coming up and making making it out, so to speak? Yeah. Um, you know, my Baltimore experience is a little crazy and different in the sense of I, I moved around a lot and I kept my family kept moving around because my father kept getting different job opportunities, uh, which is a blessing. But as a child, you know, you don't always understand that when you're being told like, hey, you're in the middle of your fifth grade year, you're going to be moving to Texas. Mm -hmm. And then you go down to Texas and you're there for three years and in the middle of your 10th or you just finished your 10th grade year of high school and they tell you you're moving back to Maryland and you go, uh, okay, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. But for me at the very beginning, Baltimore taught me what I needed to know to kind of survive and understand the differences in people. Mm -hmm. And I mean that in the sense of like, I grew up in the Park Heights area of Baltimore and I went, I grew, I, I was born and raised. I came out of Sinai hospital. So the people that are there know like, oh, Sinai, Park Heights, you know, these are areas that if you're from Baltimore, you know, yeah, it's real. But when you have a young childhood that starts in an area that is all that you know to be a good structure, you don't know anything about neighborhoods. You don't know anything about gentrification. You don't know anything about, you know, suburbs versus the city. All you know is your home and your area and what's outside. You know, you, you get that immediate grounding, but being able to see different things like, you know, people that were begging for food or money and they're right outside your door, you know, at the corner, you know, where your car would come out of the driveway is different when you can walk to the corner store and then you get to a point where you can't anymore because it's not safe. Mm -hmm. And seeing your parents recognize that. And for me, it was it was a thing of growing up in the hood and then seeing your parents get to a place of wanting a better life for themselves and their family and watching them elevate and move you into better circumstances as they sacrifice things. Mm -hmm. Whether it was my dad getting another job, if it was, you know, uh, my dad looking at a different opportunity, it was my mom going back to school, you know, because she wanted to get her doctorate, you know, whatever it was, you know, now I can say, you know, I've seen their hard work and sacrifice for their family. And it changed our perspective on things because we watched our lives go from one place to another. And we still kept a bond with friends that were there and still struggling in certain places. But having that, that kind of relationship was was kind of the thing that really molded us because we were able to see different dynamics of structure of class, different dynamics of people, how people are affected, how areas changed based off of 15 and 20 minutes. So that's kind of what growing up in Baltimore did for me. It molded me. It helped me to realize what was going on. And I appreciate it. And I love Baltimore for that. Indeed, indeed. Eloquently put too, by the way. Um, Thank you. Of course, of course. Um, not on the, not, this is not in the, the schedule, uh, list of questions, but I want to ask you because you went from, you know, you graduated high school, obviously you, you, you went to secondary school, Howard University, cause you went to that age, you, 
and I got to throw that out there because you know I love you know I love my HIU. You know what I'm saying? What it is, what it is. Well, here, here, here we are. We like kick his thieves now. You know, hey, but whatever. <laughs> um, describe what it's like going to Howard. I mean, you know, Howard is is all over the media right now, all over the news right now. Obviously, due to uh, you know for reasons that I wish that I choose not to speak on. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, uh, but but the fact nonetheless, HBCU. Describe what it was like going to HBCU for you. Okay. Uh, first off, H U U no. That's Get right. off my I'm, I'm repping it all day long. Matter of fact, I'm actually wearing school colors right now. I don't know if you can really tell. I don't know. Yeah, I'm bison. Ugh. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, for me, it was. It wasn't even a thought in the beginning of like thinking, like getting out of high school, mm -hmm. Howard wasn't the thought process in my mind because of a lot of different reasons. And I think the main one was that I had gone to school to learn how to act, to learn how to entertain. And so in being in arts magnet schools, high schools, that was my thing. I just wanted to act. And, you know, it was like, if I was going to go to a college, it would be like a conservatory. So I was thinking more of the lines of like Juilliard, um, maybe like school, NYU Tisch, you know, maybe, um, you know, a bunch of the conservatories I was thinking about in my head. And my, my parents originally didn't really, I don't want to say they didn't support me, but they didn't necessarily see acting as a means to support yourself and mm -hmm. to be a real career. So initially out of high school, I actually went to the Community College of Philadelphia and was a computer operations major. I wow. learned how to build websites. Um, I did web pages. I did like, you know, all this artistic stuff in between, you know, I did like a play and then I did like, you know, some little writing stuff, but it was nothing like my major was computer operations. I was not happy with it. That was not my passion. So I was like, y'all, I did, did a year and a half. I got to go. This is not what I want. And um, I was actually looking at, at that time, because I was in Philadelphia, I was looking at transferring to the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. But by the time that I wanted to transfer, they had already done their first round of auditions. They only had a little bit of money left. And they were like, listen, you're talented, you're great, but we don't have a lot of money left. So, you know, you might be worth like 20, but we could only give you like eight. And I was like, eh, 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 where I'm supposed to come up with the rest of this? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it didn't happen. And I went home. Yeah, I was like, uh, that math don't add up. Uh, if you carry the, mm -mm. So, I, um, I went back home to Baltimore. And this, and, and the funny story about this, because some people are like, how you go from Baltimore to Texas to Philly and all this stuff. At that time, I, we had moved back to Maryland. I was doing my 11th and 12th grade year in Baltimore. When I got done, my mom had become the, uh, I think she was the vice president of student affairs for the community college of Philadelphia. Hmm. So she was working there and coming home every weekend to be with my dad uh, because he was still working in Maryland. So, you know, they had this great understanding and relationship where they could do that. And then my mom was like, well, I can get you into school here and we kind of save if you want to go to college. And I was like, OK, let me go do this college thing. But, um, you know, it didn't work out. And I went back to Maryland. And that's when the thought came up about Howard. And that's when I had gone back to work. I became the supervisor of a bank. You know, my life is crazy, but I my dad says something about Howard. And then I started finding out about HBCUs and doing my due diligence. And then I went on a school tour. The school tour was it. That was the thing that locked it down for me, walking on that yard, seeing the history, knowing like the program, seeing, you know, kind of their dedication to things and just the inspiration of seeing so many people that looked like me yeah. that were there to study and learn so many different categories of things was like, wow, because I will tell you something when my family, you know, did their decision to kind of level up, which I do not regret in any way, shape or form, we moved into a lot of areas where I didn't see a lot of people that look like me. Hmm. 
And, you know, I keep 100. There was a lot of white people around me. And I was like one of the three black people growing up in these areas, these schools. You know, you hold on to the one or two other black people um, just because y'all look alike. Um, But, you know, that's one of those things where Howard was the difference in that because I'm looking left and right and I'm, 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 I'm shocked. I'm inspired. I'm in awe. I'm all the things because it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful to know that there are so many different people there willing to learn something. And it was like, I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of this. I like what y'all are talking about. I like what you're doing. And the program that I was for, for acting was like, yeah, they put me in a room, let me audition. And I came with the fire because I wanted it so bad. And I just, I wanted to take off like a storm and that's all I did and kind of made my life there. Um, and that's what it did for me. So that was my long tangent on Howard and HBCUs. <laughs> no, no, it's dope, it's dope. And I, and I, I think I, it, I kind of parallel to an extent. I didn't, I didn't go to any like, uh, you know, intermediate college or, you know, any anything. I went straight from high school. I barely got into Hampton, just to be honest, uh, throw my business out. I barely got into Hampton. I had to take a summer bridge program in order to be accepted. Uh, but I got I got offered to go to ha- uh, Howard Hampton in Florida A&M. Uh, and Florida A&M was too, too far for me and Howard was too close for me. And I, I like you, I did the, 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 the college walk uh, from thanks to, thanks to uh, Charles, Charles Eddie Miller. And uh, he took me and a couple other guys down there for a weekend. And I was like, bro, I am absolutely sold. I, yeah. <laughs> this is it. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I don't have any regrets um, yeah. at all. Uh, <clears throat> so being being uh, around a bunch of people that look like you, that are in the same struggle, uh, and you know it, is, is electric. And, and I think that I, I, I totally understand that, that, that position, where you come from with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but thank you for sharing. Again, is, this is this is all about you, actually. You know what I mean. And I, my, my thoughts don't count. No, nah, they do, man. I appreciate you. This is your platform, brother. <laughs> so let's get back to you, though. Seriously, how did you become an actor, though? Now you you went through you went through Howard. You you you, you made it out of Baltimore, and so forth and so on. And you 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 gave the you know the best uh, presentation of yourself. Got yourself into Howard. Came out. Now you're out. Now you're in, in L.A uh and so forth and so on but uh navigating being you know the next level how did you become an actor though so for me acting was something that started young in my childhood you know i love doing entertaining that's really what it was it was me loving to entertain the people that i was around whether it was making them laugh um, just putting a smile on their face, anything like that. So I would do talent shows. I would dance in the streets. I would have fun with my friends, you know, just trying to be that center of attention, but also just trying to make sure everyone was having a good time. And my dad noticed it. And he asked me, he said, you know, do you want to go to school to learn how to do this? Like for real? And when he asked me that, I was like, well, yeah. And that is kind of what began my journey because that's when I got into an arts magnet. You know, that's when I went to, uh, I was in Texas at the time uh, when it actually happened, but I went to Booker T. Washington High School for the performance and visual arts in Dallas, Texas. Um, Same school that actually Erica Badu went to as well. And I met her there uh, and her after she had just had her son seven. Um, And that was just one of those things that was just inspirational because I was in a, a, a school where the class subject was acting. And I was like, oh, oh, oh what? Yeah. <laughs> I get to play today. Like, but, but you're learning like these techniques and different things. And, you know, you're taking like mime and movement classes. All those things just kept igniting my fire to be like, oh, I love this. This is all me. Oh, mm. and, the, and to learn at such a young age that, this is something that you can do and never be done. Like you can never get to a point where anyone says, I've learned everything there is to learn about acting. Nope, because it's a people thing. So people are constantly learning and evolving. You can never be to a point where you have mastered people. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thing. And so, you know, thinking about that was like, ooh, ain't nobody. <laughs> oh, we 
we're going to separate ourselves with our choices, with our mind, you know, with our dedication. So coming out to L.A. after Howard was, for me, I'll be honest, very humbling, very shocking, very um, off-putting because Howard was such a structured world for me. And I felt like I was thriving so much at Howard that it it would just automatically transfer into show business. I mean, I am the guy who did this. You know, I did this production and I did this and I was the lead in this. And uh, nope, uh, because when you come out to LA, you learn that this industry is very unique and it is very complex, but it is also very clicky in the sense that people like to work with people that they know, people like to represent people that are referred to them, people like to work with people that have certain credits. And that can be a catch 21 because it can be hard to get a credit if you can't get an audition because you are not a part of a certain group or agency. Mm. And we came out here like, oh, I went to Howard. Here's my resume. I'm ready to work. And they were like, who, what? Oh, oh, Howard, the school? Oh, that's cute. That's cute. Uh, good for you. Um, but who else are you training with now? And uh, when was your, what was your last daytime television credit? You know, all these things. I was like, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm almost finished a reel. Does that count? <laughs> and they were like, silly boy, back of the line. And, it, you know, that was one of those things where it was humbling, but it was like, I know who I am. I know what I'm passionate about. And and that really separates you. So people that want to do it for different reasons usually don't last long in it because they're after one thing, whether it's fame, money, or if it's recognition, or if it's TV credit, whatever it may be. The longevity comes from the passion, I believe, because that's what keeps you persistent. That's what makes you want to keep going. You know, I've, I've, I'm 37 years old. Oop, I said my age. Oop. But, um, you know, that's not something that we shy from as black men, because you have to know who you are and right. you have to know what you want. And I know that I love the craft and I love the industry. Now, the industry doesn't always love us as a people, but we have to do what we need to do to navigate that. And I'm in that realm of constantly wanting to figure out my place in it. But I also have to see myself, how I vision myself in those rooms. Right. So it's all about that actualization, you know, living your truth, you know, living as you see yourself. If you see yourself commanding and being a presence and being a leader, then you need to step in the room and be a leader and not be shy about things. So that's what it's all about when I said, you know, this is it. This is me being an actor. It, it started young, it's kept going, and now I'm in this realm that I will not stop. Okay, <laughs> like understandable, man. Um, let me take a quick, quick pause. Lisa, Wash, Doug Washington, all the way live from DC. Say hey. hello. Um, hello. And this sister has a, has, a, has a dope platform back in DC too. She's doing a thing uh, and I love her support of the beat. Um, and at least a, love you. Uh, just let me know if you need me. Um, back to you. As far yes, as sir. all of the things that you said about uh, becoming an actor, for you, describe your the process for you to to to, to encapsulate what it's like for you to, to to take on a role. Because a lot of people, you know, you hear the rhetoric, you hear the you know the Johnny Depp's or the uh, you know, the character actors or the uh, uh, method actors or, you know what I mean? Like people, oh my, like uh, what, it, it, Keith Stansfield, oh, I need I need uh, uh, therapy because I was in this role too long. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But for mm -hmm. you, can you describe the active process and what it's like? So for me, it's all about what the project is. So whether it's a commercial, whether it's a short film, a feature film, you, for me, you can't discount any character. So I mean that in the sense of, as an actor, we can't put judgment on our characters. So I have to take what I'm given and understand all that encompasses that character. So I need to know what their backstory is. Who is this person? What's their background? What made them into who they are right now? 
Mm-hmm. You know, what, what has molded them? What's my environment? I need to know what's happening around me. I need to know where I am, what put me in this situation, where the, you know, what, whatever the present scene is. And I need to understand what I'm trying to communicate. Right. You know, what's my goal? What's my end goal? Um, you know, some people, you know, use that cliche, like, excuse me, what's my motivation? You know, but, about that. Right, 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 right. But, but that's, that's, you know, kind of in the line of things that we do. We do need to know what motivates our character to move on or to do the things that they're doing, to say the things that they're doing. And if you understand your character's backstory, you understand who they are, why they're there, where they are, um, what's brought them to this moment, uh, what, what kind of, triggers them or motivates them to do the things that they do, it helps you to be put in that place to better understand them and to live that truth so that it relates to your audience. Right. You know, we work in the realm of believability. I can't do something and, you know, just kind of whim it and think that it's going to come off as, oh, superior or believable or people are going to be like, yeah, that's that. You might be like, he is clearly acting or right. this is not that great. So it, it, it does have to be some, or there should be some type of process. And for me, it's about understanding that character, knowing all those things, and then working from a place of saying, okay, what motivates them to say this? We go more in depth, you know, each line of the, the dialogue. Um, so that's really for me, what my process is. And then I go in and I give the gift of my talent. I give the gift of my abilities. Indeed. Indeed. Mutual friend, Clifton Harris said, Will Smith said it base, best. You don't act like a character. You become the character. Absolutely. 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 Okay. Because if you're acting like the character, you're clearly going to be seen acting. It goes back to that point of believability. You become them. You encompass them. You are. You take on that life. That's right. why that understanding has to be there. If you don't do the work, you don't know. And a lot of times it is seen. Indeed. Indeed. One more. Pastor Blackman. This is this is my pastor back okay. in, the, in the DMV. As a black man pursuing your dream as an actor, do you experience uh, being held back from uh, uh, from front line, sorry, rows and offered roles that belittle blacks? I want to say that there is a mix that there are roles that we are held back on. Um, I think that is very true that that happens today. I think that people are working to try to make a difference, but realistically, the business caters to so many different realms when it comes to roles. So every actor isn't in the same realm to say that they get access to every role. Meaning that I didn't audition for Black Panther. Mm -hmm. I didn't get an opportunity to, Mm -hmm. but had I get, been given the, an opportunity, maybe I would have gotten a role. I don't know. But that comes from my representation. That comes from my uh, my connections to the industry. That comes from, you know, the body of work that I've done, the people that know about it. You know, all those factors matter. And I think that we have been in a place where people have started to use their voice more and more to say, We need equal pay, we need equal access, and we need equal rights in this industry and in life. But that's been really one of those things where I have seen it. I've seen the roles where, you know, it's casting and it wants us to be more urban or, you know, be more gangster or wants us to be the thug or wants us to be, you know, the 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 kind of like criminal or the 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 illicit actor that's going to be coming in and doing something a little shady because of the way that we look. You know, the white guys are getting the lead roles or the principal roles. It does happen. It does. But you also have to know like where you're submitting, who you're submitting with and the type of things that you want to go after so that you can kind of start trying to cater your career. You know, you you can self submit. So when you're on things and platforms like um, I'll name a couple like Actors Access and Casting Frontier and L.A. Casting, places like that, you can read the description and see who's casting it, who's the company, who's the director and say, all right, I'm going to submit to this or I like this or they're leaving the roles open. But sometimes you can get frustrated from the fact that 
a lot of these roles are saying they only want Caucasian or ethnically ambiguous actors. And so you get weeded out of a lot of opportunities that you would want and think that you could do. So it can be frustrating. So I want to just make sure that the pastor understands that it's something that we're still going through, but we also have to do uh, our own part in trying to navigate those avenues to get where we want. It's not easy. It's not going to be an overnight thing, but we are still pressing forward. And yes, I have seen it. Indeed. Shout out Pastor Blackman. Hey, bro. Love you. Um, look, uh, too, it's funny that you say, because, uh, you know, I've tried to dabble in acting myself. And you know what? I don't get stopped by ethnically ambiguous. I like to think I'm ethnically ambiguous, too. <laughs> I like to think that I see my I like to envision myself as somewhat of a, you know, uh, the, the almondy type of, you know, maybe I'm a Latino or maybe okay. I could be a, an African-American. You know, okay. it's, just, it's just a lot. You know, but the, 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 to me, you know, everybody identifies as something else. So maybe I'm just like, you know what? I would ident identify as a Caucasian American. I'm just on the date. You know, I mean, you know, it, it's where, where do you draw the limit with stuff like that? Let me ask you. Sorry. Um, it for me, it's really about the role. I'm only saying that because, yes, I try to cater searches to things that fit who I am and, you know, my abilities as an actor. But I will not lie. I have submitted to things that say Caucasian only, to things that say ethnically ambiguous, to things that say Latin, um, Hispanic. I've submitted. And sometimes I'll even put in a note to, like, the director or the casting director to be like, listen, I know that you all put Caucasian. I want you to know that I did read the breakdown, but I believe that I could do this role and I would love the opportunity if you were to call me in for an audition. Now, I will say this out of if I had to guess out of the five times that I've done something like that, I've gotten the audition or an opportunity to audition once. Mm. So okay. once out of five times, but you got to shoot your shot. Why not? Of What's course. it going to hurt? I mean, realistically, you don't get blacklisted in this industry over auditioning um, or submissions. So, you know, no one's going to be like, you know, this is that actor who submitted to the white role and he is a black man. Let's ban him from everything. That does not happen. <laughs> that does not happen. Like, they might look at it and have like a moment in their office that you don't know about where they're like, this guy didn't read. <laughs> Clearly, this guy didn't read. <laughs> Next. But yeah, I'm okay with that because the offset chance that somebody goes, you know what? This is creative. And he took a go at it. I, you know what? Fine. Let's do it. Call him in. See what he's got. Right. Hello. Might be the difference in you paying rent that month. Might be the difference in you having the real inspiration and strength that you need to start taking more risks and leaps in your career. Mm -hmm. So that's why we can't hold back. That's why it's not a stupid idea. That's why it's not a bad idea. That's why it's not even a crazy idea. Because half the people that we support and know about that are doing things right now have gotten tremendous starts by taking a chance or doing something crazy. Indeed. I love your perspective on it. Thank you for sharing. Sure you. Absolutely. Now, the flip side of the coin, because we talked about what, what, what the process is for you. What are the misconceptions that you've experienced, the common misconceptions? Um, you know, I'm sure you've heard the rhetoric about how they did the business. What are the common misconceptions about the acting side of things, um, getting roles, uh, being casted? I mean, we, we shared a lot, actually, already. But to you and your experience, what are common misconceptions that, that you know, the general public that you've heard, you know, experienced the general public? But you're like, really, it's not like that. It's kind of like this. You know what I mean? Yeah. I would say some general misconceptions would be that once you're on TV, you're rich or that once you uh, land a commercial, you're paid for life or paid for the rest of the year. <laughs> Those are some common misconceptions I'm gonna speak on because being on TV, a lot of people think you're on TV, like you, you made it, you're rich or you got a paycheck or you set in some way, you, you did it. You can be on TV for free. The news can interview you and you can be on TV for free. You can do a television show that people know of and be background and work for $50 to $100. You can do a commercial and make $200. Now, you can do a commercial and make $200,000. The difference is the type of commercial. 
you get a national commercial versus a local <laughs> or a regional, those pay differently. There are so many different pay scales that affect television in the realms of the entertainment industry and that people don't know. So sometimes people see things and they assume something. You can do a first year on a hit show and not make a lot of money. And people gonna wonder what's going on because you're on a hit show. Yeah, it's a hit this year, but they paid us not knowing if it was gonna be a hit. Right. <laughs> so, or get recasted. Hello. And I've seen actors who have done a pilot. And the pilot is just pilot season for some people that don't know is basically a a, a span of time where actors shoot upcoming potential shows and then networks go and look at all those shows and see which ones they want to actually turn into a show that's going to be on their network for you to watch. Right. But here's what networks can do. They can watch a pilot cast by a bunch of actors, maybe even me, and we could do a great job on it. And they go, okay, cool, cool. I like the show. I'm going to recast it. I'm going to put in all people that I know or that we took from another show that we're doing so that we can have seat fillers or people that have a name recognition, people that have a bigger name than them or bigger following. So we'll guarantee those ratings on the, when the show hits. We don't want it to flop or you know have to cancel it early because that's money lost for us. Mm -hmm. So you get recast after you did a pilot. You think you're about to be on because that show gets you know uh, greenlit? No, no, no. So you are dropped. <laughs> And you can get cast on a hit show and be dropped when it's canceled and not, and you only get paid for what you've shot. So if you had like five episodes upcoming and you thought you was going to make like 30 grand and those five don't shoot and it cancels, you are out of that money. So the misconceptions in the industry are that there are different pay scales for different things that show up on TV. So just because you see your friends doing different things or working constantly, it does not mean that they are necessarily rolling in money. It, and it may mean that their career is going well because there's consistency. But just understand that there's so many different levels to this that people may not understand. And some people are doing it for the wrong reasons. That part. Mm -hmm. And I even got a thorn in the realm of game shows too, you know, because I'm a victim of that. And Lord knows my phone was ringing off the hook, like, oh, you did it. And I'm like, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you on TV, brother, you made it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I, I just knew you always had it in you. I'm like, what? So when you know? when is my car coming? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Anyway. <laughs> Hey, like, I always knew you could do it when you get me a Benz. Yeah. Like, <laughs> difficult. Times is hard out here for Pimp, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, but thank you uh, for sharing. Those are actually very poignant points as far as the misconceptions, man. And I'm glad you cleared up a lot of that because that that absolutely, I, I've experienced it. And I'm not even an actor yet. So, I, I, I and, and I'm put that underscore yet. But, you know, I, I'm just trying to be like you when I grow up one day. You know, hey man, you are an actor. I've seen your stuff. You've <laughs> not yet, <laughs> but one day I shall get there. <laughs> By dang it! <laughs> so let's uh let's let's transition really quick. Mm -hmm. We talked about acting because you you have a you have a very diverse skill set. That's one of the things I, I I admire the most about you, and I and I I watch and I glean from you. Let's switch over to this comedy. Because I met you, he said, yeah, I've, I've done comedy. And I, I, I'm literally blown away. I'm like, yo, you're the, literally the first comedy comedian I've ever, you know, known. Uh, like, just no. Like, I, I I know certain comedians that, I, you know, I've met, you know, as as they've already have, have achieved and so forth and so on. But as far as just literally first person shaking hands with that I've identified with and had conversations with, the first comedian that I've ever met that I could actually get information and speak with you about. How did you become, how did you become a comedian? Okay, so this is crazy. I haven't done comedy in a little while. I haven't been on the stage in a while, but I actually got into comedy from one of my really good friends named Kason Wilson. Okay. Now, Kason Wilson went to Howard University with me and he is out here now with his wife in LA and tearing up the comedy scene. He is an, an amazing comic. Um, 
he started doing comedy at Howard. We were in acting together and he just started going out and doing stand up comedy and writing. And I was like blown away because he was one really good. And he just like had this like no fear attitude and would get up there and do it. And I was like, how in the world? Like this room of people. And he was like, I want you to do it. He was like, you're, you're funny. You need to do comedy. Like, I'm just telling you, you need to do it. And I was like, no, no, I kept putting it off. I was like, no, no, you silly man. I will not. And one night he like set me up and was like, and the next comic is Kyle Jones coming on up. And I was like, oh, snaps. I am not prepared. And I got up there and um, pretty much bombed. <laughs> but <laughs> what I did was it, 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 it gave me the push and it gave me that little bit of bug that I needed to kind of be like, oh, I kind of like this. Even though I didn't do as well as I wanted to, I probably told like three jokes. I think I got one laugh. The other two was just kind of like, people were like, okay, yeah, I mean, it's cool. And I was like, all right, well, let me finish up here. You know, and I finished the set, but it made me like, oh yeah, I could do this. I, 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 I can do better. I was like, I can do better. I can write better material. I can get this thing together. I'm coming back up here and I will make these people laugh. You will be entertained. You will. <laughs> so I have to really give all the credit to my boy, Kason Wilson. Okay. Okay. Shout out Kason Wilson. Shout yeah. out. Uh, for the process when you were writing, You can even draw from the first time. Well, obviously, you didn't write for the first time because you were set up. But any mm -hmm. other time that you went out there, can you describe the writing process? Because for people like me, like I've always felt the, 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 the itch. I'm not even going to lie to you. I, I, you know, I'm just curious. I, I'm naturally inquisitive about experiences, right? And I was like, mm -hmm. you know, and I've had even people say, man, bro, you funny, bro. Like, you should just, you should be do stand up. And I'm like, bro, mm -hmm. I don't know the first thing about writing it. I don't know the first thing about anything. I don't, I don't want to be the guy that just, just, you know, goes up there and just like, so, uh, yeah, hi. You know what I mean? Like, you know, so describe the right process. For, for the All right. So, um, I think I would think everyone's process could be different. For me, it's really about I try to think about things that are either funny to me or stories that have happened to me that not a lot of people know about. Or situations. Mm -hmm. So I've written about, uh, I've written a set on massages where I, I've talked about like three different things about massages because I love getting a massage, but I've also had good and bad experiences. So I've had experiences where I came out here to LA and wanted to figure out, you know, different things about the different types of massages because you see like Thai, Swedish, hot stone, uh, deep, you know, muscle conditioning, you know, you know, there's all these different types of, you know, massages you can get. And so yeah, I was like, you. yeah, I was like, listen, I'm gonna do a set on comedy because I've had some crazy experiences. Like I went to a place one time, uh, I was checking this thing out for right before my birthday one year. And I walked into this spa to get a massage and, um, like three red flags went off for me because uh, the first one was I walked in there and the person was like, hey, thank you for coming. You know, go ahead in the room. You know, you get an hour. You know, that's what I want an hour or paid for or whatever. Go back in the room. And she was like, would you like a man, a woman or trans? And I, I was like, uh, 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 excuse me, a uh, uh, woman? <laughs> I was, uh, I, you know, I was, I was off a little shock because that was my first time having those options. Right. You know, you don't get those all those options, but that came. So I was like, maybe that's a flag. I'm gonna just put it as a flag because I've I've never gotten all those options. I've had massages before, but okay, whatever, cool. I made my choice. <laughs> the second one was when I was getting a massage and the the person decided to stand up and then stand on my back. And I was like, oh, Jesus, I, d I didn't know this was happening. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. I thought you was about to, you know, uh, 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 like work on my shoulders or something. No, she she worked my spine. Um, and the third flag was when, I don't know if I should tell this, but basically they, they stretch you as well. I didn't know this at the time of going in, but uh, she just, she kind of um, folded my legs 
up by my head and uh, I was naked. So uh, all my, <laughs> my nether reasons was just up in the air and this woman was there just stretching me like it was a Tuesday. And I was like, uh, my, my stuff is just, uh, well, okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that was, uh, you know, for me, it was like I drew from the actual experience that happened to use in my writing. And then I tried to say, how can I write this in a story format to then be enticing to the audience so that I can say like, hey, let me structure this in a way that makes sense. So after I basically write out the idea or what I want to talk about, which may be massages, then it's OK. What was the experience? OK, was, let's talk about a bad one. So it's this one. All right, let's talk about another one where I got burnt by hot stones when this lady just put them on my back and didn't like ease me into it or rub on them. I don't think she checked. I think she towel got them and just dropped them on my back. OK, burnt me. OK, I felt like it was a thug cry. And I mean that in the sense of like, I stayed on the table like a G, but a tear rolled down my face. And she didn't know because I just, I just stayed there like, oh, yes, you know, I had to yes, take it like a glory tree. tree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Straight up Denzel on him. I was Denzel. That was my moment right there. <laughs> you know, so you get into character <laughs> for real. <laughs> 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 but, um, you know, for me, it's really about that, you know, drawing from experiences, thinking about your audience, because that's an important thing, knowing your audience. And you when you're writing for me, it's writing things that work for different audiences. So I have to know that just in case I think in my mind I'm going into a crowd that's maybe full of millennials or an older crowd or a church crowd or, you know, an afternoon vibe where I could be dealing with some people that are more um, politically sensitive or racially sensitive. You know, I have to be cognizant of that. But you also have to be quick on your toes because you never know what crowd you're going to get in the sense of who's going to feel like being a heckler if at all but you know or who's gonna feel offended by something you say or if the crowd doesn't react you know how do you transition to the next joke so it's about finding that rhythm within yourself but the easiest thing that i found is drawing from experiences that you've had putting them in a story format and then working through them so that there are clear beats that you can execute to be like all right i'm gonna set it up here i'm gonna hit them with this as the punchline I'm going to set it up here, hit him with this. I can transition to this like because I'm thinking about this just in case. Because sometimes you get on a roll and you want to feed off that audience and you don't want to stop. So you have to kind of be in a place where you've got your set, but you also are cognizant of what's going on. And, and you know, practice. Be quick on your feet and feel good about it so that when you get up on stage, it's like whatever happens here, I'm laying it down. If y'all like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. Because it takes skin to do this. And I mean, and, and, and it doesn't take it doesn't take um, testosterone. You don't have to be a man to do it. You don't have to be a woman to do it. It takes skin. It takes the ability, the risk to just step up on stage and share your thoughts. That's it. Anybody can do it. But you have to be willing to take that step. And so I want you to know that I believe in you as well. You can do it, Dottie. Well, I'd like to think I can tackle a lot of things, you know. <laughs> I can do anything. <laughs> anything you can do, I can do better. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's it's dope. Uh, I actually had a question, but uh, uh, Pastor Blackman said that it was it was our it was answered. But literally, I'm gonna just share anyway. He said, mm -hmm. "Do you ever write material beforehand and get on stage and fill the crowd and freelance?" And then he said, "You just answered it." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I try to always write material, but I have definitely free done my thing, freestyle up there. Because sometimes, you know, you just feel inspired or you start off like I've, I've written a whole set, then got up there and did nothing but reading the audience. I dug into the audience because it was like a bunch of people being booed up. I was like, oh, y'all on a date? And then you let the audience answer questions, feedback off of them. I'm cracking on you. Oh, you sitting there by yourself. You know, I'm going to talk about you. OK, is you waiting on somebody or is you hoping to get chose? You know, I'm I'm just feeding through it. So I've gone through my whole thing, didn't touch my material because I was feeding and the crowd loved it. And it's like, hey, I'm a, that's it. My job is done. My job is to entertain. So my job is done. Indeed. Indeed. So let me ask you this really quick, because uh, we, we I, I'm enjoying this conversation and I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm respectful. Uh, how are you on time? You good, good on time or do we need to kind of you truncate some things or so forth and so on? 
Nope, I'm good on time right now, man. I'm going to get some food after this, but I'm not starving and I'm not running out on you. <laughs> Roger that. Roger that. No, I, I appreciate you, man. Uh, just wanted to ask that question. And, uh, you know, no, viewers, you. I, I, I appreciate you guys for, 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 for hanging in with us, man, and, and, and engaging. Thank you very much, especially Pastor Blackman. I appreciate you, uh, as always. Um, let's transition now. Mm-hmm. One more game. Because, you know, again, adding to the the multitude of skill sets that you have, you know, and, and, and these are very, although connected, very diverse skill sets, right? Mm-hmm. You're now also a host. Welcome to the league. You know, I'm, I'm new to the league myself <laughs> of hosts. Yeah. And, and 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 being able to should be have the freedom and 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 the, the you know the platform to be able to share your thoughts and your emotions and feeling, feelings and and be ex- exposed on certain aspects of how you feel about things, um, and you are the co-host of uh, a a podcast as well. Yes. So what did the you know open it up and ask what is love in Los Angeles? Okay, so right now, Love in Los Angeles is a podcast that is created to talk about the journey that myself and my fiance have in Los Angeles. And it deals with love, it deals with uh, relationship issues, it deals with navigating life, I should say, as a journey, and not just in Los Angeles, but also in the world, because a lot of times people come out to Los Angeles and feel lost. So instead of making it love and loss, Angeles, we made it lost because a lot of times you can feel lost. And the we made the symbolism, the T in lost being more emphasized like a symbol of God because we're God loving people. For us, it was about sharing that to hopefully inspire and help people that were going with going through and dealing with different issues in their relationships. Um, My fiance and I met February 2nd, 2007, and uh, we are engaged to be married. Of course, the pandemic has affected many things with that in terms of wedding dates and all of that. But, you know, we've been on this journey for over 14 years of knowing each other and navigating life and seeing things happen with each other in terms of career, personal things, as well as our artistic endeavors. And this was basically a point where we said, you know, we should come together and do something to show, you know, our experience and to be able to give back and to maybe answer questions. Because a lot of times people ask, like, how in the world are y'all together? Like, how are y'all functioning right now? How have y'all been in each other's lives this long and still been okay? And it's, um, you know, it's not been an easy journey, but it's been one that we think is beneficial to share. Uh, Currently, we're on a hiatus. Uh, we have taken a couple of months off just to get through some things with the end of the year and my fiance's birthday. But hopefully we'll we will be resuming in the next two months to get back on track and maybe even transition the idea of it to something else. But that's what it is and why it is. Love in Los Angeles. Indeed. Shout out to Tiana. Um, you know, that throw it out there. Happy, happy belated birthday. I, I reached out to her and told her, sorry, me and Monique missed the uh, birthday, but you know, we, we love her, we love her and you know, just you know, wish we could have been there, but we couldn't. But uh, you know, definitely a, a beautiful soul and uh definitely every bit of uh, of a compliment for you. You guys are awesome. you guys are model, you know what I mean? So I I, I love and appreciate both of you guys, man. Flat, flat no, thank you, man. Switch it. Switch it up. Any new projects? What you currently working on? Anything new that's cooking in the kitchen, man? Yes. I'm staying silent about this little grind, but I'm writing. I will say that much. I'm writing, working on uh, developing something right now, and I'm excited about it. But I'm learning. I'm just right now, I'm learning a process to get it done um, in a more... Uh, seamless manner. And this is exciting for me because it's something that I've wanted to tackle for a while. And now I've just kind of taken that next leap to learn what I need to from some people that have been doing it. So I'm just delving into that really this week of uh, that next step, which is that learning process so that I can start executing some greatness by the end of this year that I'm excited about. So new projects come in writing. Um, We'll do some artistic stuff uh, later, probably in the next two months, um, with revamping Love in Los Angeles. But 
that's where we are right now. And I'm excited about things. So, yeah. I'm excited you're excited about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, back really quick, Pastor Blackman said, does, uh, does Kyle uh, have a website? Do you guys have a website or YouTube where you can listen or view your show? Love and yes. Show. We don't have a website right now, but we do have the YouTube channel is Love and Lost Angeles. Um, and we also have an IG page, which is Love and Lost Angeles. Check us out. You can follow us on IG there. Um, very easy to do so. We have about 11 or 12, I think, episodes that are launched now. So feel free to go through them. You'll see the progression of the show where it goes from the beginning of us just learning how to shoot a camera uh, onto YouTube and make a video, you know, which is crazy because people are like, you're an actor. It's you real. No, no, it's, it's I'm an actor. I am in front of the camera. I'm not behind it. So learning that was a skill. So don't y'all judge me out there, world, okay? But you will see the progression. It gets better. The later videos, you will see the quality update. I had to tap into some people like Donnie Got the Beats to know how to do certain things. But I thank y'all for the support. <laughs> Appreciate you, man. <laughs> so there it is, like I said, Love in Los Angeles. So we, we are a little further beyond and halfway through the show. Again, I just want to make sure you're good with time. Yes, I'm good. I, I know I at least got uh, another 14 minutes for sure. Okay. Well, I can guarantee 14. Guarantee 14. Okay, we're going to try to rumble through these then. Make sure we get the, the maximize of 14 minutes. Boop, 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 boop. boop. Look at that. Yep. Moved you up to the ceiling for a little bit, but I got you. <laughs> well, well, welcome back. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> the, so we at my favorite part of the beat. And this is this is something that a lot of guests and a lot of people that know me feel that this is a very uh, quaint part of the, the interview, which is called Hot Topics. Anybody Ooh. that knows the beat knows that the Hot Topics is what the Hot Topics is. <laughs> Questions designed to break uh, away from the norm for you to get to understand exactly who you are as a person uh, by getting away from the normal interview. Right? Yes, so question, indeed. Let's get started. Three things you don't know. What are three things that you feel that the world does not know about Kyle Jones? Mm. I don't know if people really know how much I love guns. I have an infatuation with them. I like to go to the range and shoot them. I also don't know if people know that you might, I mean, maybe I've posted it, but both my parents are doctors. I didn't know you both your parents are doctors. Shout, yeah. out to, shout out to Kyle's parents. I love them. They, they're the dopest couple that I that I know. Me and, too. You know, they're the dopest ones I know. And they're not medical doctors. So people be like, oh, yeah, y'all drive around in Billings all day. No. <laughs> <laughs> they have their doctorates, okay, in education. Still talented. Don't play my family where Jones is, okay? Keep up with the. Uh, Joneses. Okay. No. <laughs> um, that's two. Uh, what's the third thing? Oh, okay. This is embarrassing, but I'm going to share it anyway. A lot of people don't know that I don't really do the whole verb noun thing, knowing all the grammatical things like that. Yeah. I kind of rely on computers and stuff from time to time, but okay. I'm an English level writer like English honors writing capability when I was in college and testing and stuff. So I can write well. It's just, if you're like, oh, let me write this out and see what's the predicated verb and which one's the noun. I'll be like, a uh, noun is a person, place, or thing. That's it. <laughs> I respect that. I, I, that. I do. I get it. I'm not, I'm not the best with it either. And people, people applaud me for my vernacular, but I'll be like, at the end of the day, why? Like, you know, <laughs> you know, like you said, get spell check. Spell check yeah. it. It works. Yeah. And and I'm just the cute with 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 uh uh certain certain verbiage because it's just like I read it. Yeah. <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like so, I'm familiar. I learned that part or I learned this or I can structure this well. But yeah, all the nitty gritty, not always there. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh Pastor Black said good night, he has to sign out, good interview and talk. Have a great night, Pastor Blackman. 
Clifton Harris says he has pictures from Vegas. I don't know what he's speaking of, but I'm sure they are uh, epic. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm sure they don't need to be shared on this platform because whatever happens in Vegas better stay in Vegas. <laughs> that part. <laughs> Clifton. <laughs> right. All right, so you got to the three things you don't know. My playlist popped in. What's in your playlist that you feel everybody else need to be like, you know, up on? Like, you know, that you feel are like prestige level. Okay. So this is going to be kind of bad because I get a lot of credit for my music that I play yeah. in and around play people and places. But I really got to be honest and I'm, I don't ever lie. Apple Music is my savior for the music game. I love Apple Music because I have curated many playlists that work for me, like new music, new artist playlists, um, uh, like even the updated tracks like Weekend Worthy, New Era, New Music. I focus on a plethora of music categories. So I'm not just hip hop. I'm not just r and I'm not just rap. I'm, you know, neo soul. I'm pop. I'm a little bit of country, swag, I'm jazz, I'm all of those things. So new artists and new music entice me because I'm always looking to set a different type of vibe. So I don't have a set playlist, but I got a couple like, you know, Apple Music ones that know me and I got my own station <laughs> and they love me because they gave me my own station. You should have. But that's at least how I feel. So yeah, it's really Apple Music is what saves me. But I, I got some popping music. Indeed. Indeed. Do you have specific artists or specific songs that have caught your attention that you would have just quickly shout out for people so they can be one? Just anything that just kind of just like, have you heard the Blitz of Blase Block? Oh, I feel like, uh, of course, right now I am blank. I feel blank. I feel like I got nothing to offer. Um, mm -hmm. Let me think of some That's fire. Some good people. Um, Masigo. Masigo, talented brother who produces, uh, does his own musical tracks and lyrics. Um, I like Russ. Uh, man, I like PNB Rock. I like the Baby. I like Lil Baby. I like Future. <laughs> you know? Like all the babies. Right. I like, I am in awe over people's technical abilities and sounds. And I, and as much as I don't like my fiance playing the mess out of it, Jasmine Sullivan's new album, Hotels, is sensational. Her voice has always been one to reckon with. So, uh, Jasmine Sullivan, Ari Lennox, um, Summer Walker, um, Ooh, Snow Allegra, you know, people like that are where I'm at right now with my vibe or some of those artists. Okay, dope. And a little known fact, too, and, and uh, people who watch the beat are, that are consistent and have watched it, they've heard me mention it before, something that you can share to Tiana. It's interesting. Uh, Jasmine Sullivan used to be managed by, by my cousin way oh, back, in, back in the day. Uh, and I recently, when I went back home this 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 past Christmas to clean out my mother's bait, uh, 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 garage. I found her demo tape from when my cousin wow. That's you know what I mean? crazy. Yeah, it, it's crazy. Cause I wanted to shake them back then, and it, it's just the whole story about behind that. I'll share it with mm -hmm. you later on, but you know, I, don't, I refuse to share it on the air because it might be incriminating for him. <laughs> uh, uh, so forth. Right. So, Get but, things clear. But I also yeah. got another artist on um, my playlist that I like to frequent from time to time. His name is Donny B. Got the beats. Oh, and uh, there are some tracks out um, that he has played and that I like to um, kind of circulate on my playlist. So look out for that artist as well. That, that sounds like somebody you need to stay tuned to. I, I just, I, you know, something about it resonates with the inner ear, with the outer ear, with it came through with the cerebellum. And it's just like, mm. it's like you know, Bang. fine by me. <laughs> that is fine by me. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Let's share this too. Clifton, Clifton Harris clarified. He said uh, the pictures in Vegas that he has is with Kyle and guns. Nothing. Ain't got NRA. Ain't got nothing on you, brother. Yep. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to say anything that is incriminating <laughs> in this time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it, just, it was a little awkward, but you know, whatever. We love you, yeah. Clifton. Cliff, hey, bro. It's all love, bro. 
I'm a proud and legal owner. <laughs> <laughs> Netflix, Netflix, what? That that is uh, the last of the uh, hot topics. What's on your Netflix playlist that you feel like you know what is at the top? That it's like you know what y'all need to see this because clearly y'all need to see this. Mm, wow, and these are just Netflix shows, right? No, 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 no. It's, it's okay. Any uh, streaming? Any anything? It could be Hulu. Stream it, 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 it be shows or movies. Mm -hmm. Just whatever you're viewing. What is it? Oh, okay. So today on Netflix, I actually just watched the movie I Care a Lot, uh, which is actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, things I've recently seen that I like that are out. Um, I'm watching things like, I don't even know where to start, man. I got it all. I'm watching shows like 911 right now. You know, the fiance, we watch 911, 911 Lone Star. Um, I like game show network stuff. But when I'm when I'm thinking about shows that are complex that I like that really pull me in or I like the writing or the way that they're structured, I'm talking about shows like The Affair, Billions. I'm talking about um controversial things that are like, um, oh man, I'm looking to blank on some of these <laughs> things, but sure. oh, American Skin, um, great. Um, oh man, that's so many. I just want to pull up something and roll. I should go back to my computer or my, my television and just start pulling up the shows, but some things like that. I, I, I got a couple of them out, but those are different shows that I like that have great writing in them that I've seen done well, that are inspiring. Um, I'm looking for complexities of stories that are well done and written. Um, there've been so many that have passed or that have gone off or that I've binged already because that's just what I do. But um, I'm getting into the crown. And I know that a lot of people have been talking about the crown lately, but I'm getting into the crown. Um, I liked, uh, what was that one? the girl who's the uh, Queen's Gambit. I enjoyed Queen's Gambit, the way that that was structured and done. So, you know, I'm just looking at things like that. So shows that are and movies that are telling a story and telling it well and keeping the audience's attention in a captivating way, because those are the types of work that I want to create. Indeed. So that's where I'm at. Indeed. And uh, just as a, as a uh, quick sidebar, uh, did you catch Euphoria? Oh yes, Lord, Euphoria. That yes. was killed in that. I thoroughly enjoyed Euphoria. Hey, that was gonna kill that Zendaya, man. Good God, she was a problem in that, bro. Like her yeah. acting chops was it. Malcolm and, and was it Malcolm and Marie. Yeah, I haven't seen that one yet, but I've heard <laughs> acting wise. Her yeah. and uh, uh, Denzel's son. Yeah, James. That's all I gotta say. Story wise, God, David so, yeah. So, 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 story wise, might be a little something, something, but acting, mm -hmm. it's a they got bodies. It's a murder. <laughs> 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 so that's the end of the day. But thank you for sharing. So we made it through hot topics, and we are almost Ooh. out of there. We got a, uh, a few more topics to go, and then we go. And then we be watching me. You mentioned earlier American Skin. Yes. I saw it too. I adored it. Thought it was amazing. Uh shout out to uh my brother too, Lawrence Watford. He uh he did a film too, uh, and it was very much in the same vein. Um and I don't want to take away from American Skin right now. So fortunately, you know, I apologize, Law. You know, as much as I would love to shamelessly plug plug your, your giant, we're gonna go with American Skin right now. American Skin versus Judas and the Black Messiah. Mm. So I haven't seen oh. Judas and the Black Messiah. Okay, so this is okay. That's yes. that's totally fine. But your thoughts on American Skin? How do you feel that it resonated with with American people? And should it be something that is something that is kind of like, um, uh, like impactful for young culture, uh, African-American culture, or just black people in general? Like, what are your th overall thoughts on it and how how it, how it you believe it should resonate with people? Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I don't know that it's had the marketing and promotion that it needed. Great. And I think that the movie itself 
is beautifully done, beautifully written, beautifully executed, beautifully cast. I think all the things for it. Um, is it a perfect film? No. Is it um, well done? And and I say well done in the sense of not just the way that it looks, but I say that in the sense of what it covers and the ability to cover different viewpoints is for me always a good thing because you you never know what audience is watching. And so when you wanna make something that's receptive to the world, you kind of need to play in that realm of the devil's advocate a little bit, or even just kind of like the other side to be like, if I'm gonna pose this point or try to make this point, I also need to understand the questions that are coming from the other side or give someone a voice for that other side so that it can be a legitimate argument or a legitimate point being made because we can then see this is your point, this is my point, how do they come together? You know what I mean? So I, I think that I really have to credit the film for that in itself. I just, I, I, I don't like the fact that I don't feel like that many people know about it and know what it's about in this time. You know, we, we, we've gotten through the George Floyd protests. We've gotten through the pandemic, uh, surviving almost a year of kind of just being in the midst of that. But now it's like, here's a movie that talks about some of the issues that people have screamed, been screaming and been fighting for. And I don't know if, enough people know about it. And that's a little disheartening for me to see something done so well and not get the platform or credit that it deserves. And it's on a great platform because it's on a major network, you know, to access and stream, but that promotion about it, because I, I heard about it, but I didn't know about it like I've seen other things. And I know that the the realm is different because somebody who's talented like Nate Parker, who, you know, is a great actor, great writer, you know, great businessman, especially after his deal with Sundance uh, over the uh, uh, the past couple of years. Um, and for him to get this thing kind of greenlit by Spike Lee, I thought was just great because Spike knows those hurdles. Spike knows those real issues that Lost your call for a second. Not sure if you hear me or not. These types of things happen again. Uh, I definitely agree with what Kyle was saying. Um, the American Skin film was uh, is amazing. It's amazing for the culture. Uh, Nate Parker is an extremely talented writer. Uh, actually, trying to I reached out to him to see if I could get him on the beat. Um, it's one of those things as to where it's like, I believe it's one of those things where you need to see it. You need experience. You need to understand exactly what it is. Um, that film, as well as Catharsis, by the way, uh, so I want to take this opportunity to uh, spotlight uh, Lawrence Anthony Watford. Uh, Catharsis fits right in with American Skin, uh, American Skin and Jack, Judas and the Black Messiah. Um, these are introspect where they say life imitates art, imitates life. Uh, things that are designed to mirror exactly what we are experiencing as people. Here goes Kyle right here. Oh Welcome man, back. I disappeared. No, it's all right. It's all right. Totally fine. You know, we're just uh, speaking on, uh, back on your commentary on what, what you were saying with regard to uh, American Skin. Uh, do you recall where you were? Yeah, I was just basically saying like, it's unfortunate for something like that to have the platform that it does being on a major streaming service, but not have for me the the same promotion and recognition and dollars behind it because Spike Lee goes into these rooms and says, listen, I'm ready to create something. Let's go. And the budget is five million when you get other people that are getting 20, 30, 50 million to do things. And it's like, we still can't get the same pay recognition you know any of these things and it's it's frustrating especially a story like this that needs to be told 
And that should be because it's giving you all the things that are focused on this situation. You know, it's looking at the, the, the character of the child who is learning about police, police brutality, who's learning about the law, who's opening their mind up to different things and what they can control and what they're allowed to do, what their, uh, what their rights are. And you look at the father who want, has this protective vibe that wants to, you know, ensure that his son is doing the things that he needs to do to survive as a black man dealing with a police encounter. Right. And that's a different story that a lot of people don't always understand that I black understand. people have to deal with police yeah. differently. The way that we act, the way that we respond, all of those things are different for us. The circumstances are different because we have been targeted for years. And that's something that's different for a lot of people to get that 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 really conjecture of saying, I guess that's a real thing for you, but I don't, I don't, I don't feel that personally. And now you get that viewpoint of the police who are like, well, you know, uh, you know, we have a job to do. And it's up to us to determine if something is wrong. And we have these parameters to work within. Police are given a lot of parameters and a lot of freeway to be able to make decisions where they can choose and choose not to elevate situations. And nine times out of 10, it seems as if things are elevated immediately for a person of color versus someone who is not. Right. And to have an officer say like, well, yes, you were targeted. Or you were, uh, you were, you know, sought after, or you were kind of picked out of the line, or whatever. Is like for us as a people, it's like, well, yeah, yeah, we knew that. But other people, it's like, oh, really? You're gonna admit that? Like, you're gonna let out our secrets? Like, what? And that's not always an easy thing. So I love a movie that talks about relevant issues, that gives the viewpoint of other people's perspectives, and that has some type of resolution. We have to come to some type of ground. So that's a thing that's like, all right, let's make sure that we're really saying this. And that's why I'm glad that the thing was out there, that the film was out there. But I think that more people need to know about it. Right. Right. I, I, I agree with you. I think the the, the, the thing that uh is was paramount to me it was just the fact that like you said, I'm glad that they told the story from the from the from the father's perspective. I really am. Because, you know, more times than not, it's like, you know, it's kind of like a, 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 a subliminal cancel culture on black male, too. Um, and, and it's been that way in, 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 in film and TV for, for a long time because it's just all oh, I mean, black dads are bad dads. And every single brother that I know that's, that has a child is, are dope parents. Every single one of them. You know what I mean? But, you know, we are excommunicated. You know what I mean? And uh, for, for sake of saying women is key, women is law, women is everything. And to show it from the, the the experience of mom still having the power and the strength that she had and being the voice that she was. But yeah, pops have a voice too. We have our own issues and perspectives to deal with from, uh, from, from that perspective as well. And then when you talk about at the end of the day, I think a lot of times you just don't understand what lineage means. Especially when you talk about from a black man to his black son, you know what I mean? And I think that, that that goes away too, it gets lost because that, that especially, and then that, not to take away from, you know, uh, girl dads, you know, or black girl dads like Kobe, but you know, when you have a son, it's like everything, you know what I mean? Like that's you, point 2.0. And yeah. to have that erased from you, that, that, that has something that it, it has substantial uh, effect on you, you know what I mean. So I, I, I think the movie overall was a very brilliant movie. I thought it was put together well with the budget that it that it had. Um, the casting was, like you said, excellent. The story was was top notch. Um, I definitely agree with every sentiment that you, that you made. Uh, as when you were gone, I wanted to uh, shout out while you're on the film. It's something I want you to check out too because it's my brother, uh, Law Watford. Now I'm going to do the shameless plug. Check out uh, uh, Catharsis. Uh, I can send you the link if you're interested. Uh, it's yeah. a, it's an amazing film. It's right it's right in line with the same thing. In fact, when in nice. the other podcast I do, Tooth Blue West, uh, we 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 talked about his uh, Catharsis film, and then we talked about the similarities and 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 in, in, in a concept with American Skin. Uh, mm -hmm. But it American Skin Catharsis 
Judas and the Black Messiah. Hell, I'll even throw in, uh, I, and I, I'm a big fan of um, um, Janelle Monae's uh, joint. Um, for, for the life of me, I can't I drew a blank. But Jan Janelle Monae's joint that she that she did um, um, with the, why can't I think of the daggone name right now? That's unfortunate. Nonetheless, her film was was really good too, and I think that you know black people overall these these films are necessary. Antebellum. Antebellum. Thank you. Okay. It started with an A, but I didn't want to sound ignorant. Right. Um, no, 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 I didn't want to slaughter it too. You saw my face. I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those those films actually are are very introspective films. I think those are <laughs> films that really get to the, the it challenges if if you have an open mind and you're not uh, programmed by you know uh, you know crow programmed or you know programmed from the institution of uh, from the institutionalization into institutionalization of america mm -hmm. those films all of the films that are named are top notch in, in order for you to understand exactly who you are uh and yes uh, lisa agrees a very very powerful film mm -hmm. very deep uh, and she agrees with antebellum too um <laughs> So again, check out all of those films uh, that I that I mentioned: Antebellum, um, American Skin, Judas and the Black Messiah, Catharsis. Um, with all that being said, what are your thoughts on the current state of the union? Current state of the union, man. Um, right now, I think that we're just in a unique place of hopeful change, and I say that in the sense of it's the beginning of the year. Kind of, sort of. We're already in March, almost. <laughs> um, so it's flying by. But we're in this place of coming through this pandemic and also, I think, trying to really see what is going to happen in the world now that we have a new president, a new vice president, HU, stand up. Um, and we are just really trying to see what's going to happen in the world with, you know, our lives. You know, how are we going to be affected with, you know, unemployment, taxes, the presidency, political issues that affect us here in this state, California, but across the world? Because, you know, we've really been looking at things and for people to show who they are. And I think that the the things that have been going on have really ignited people to want to see change. And so I think that now it's really that place of show up or show out. And I want to see what happens because we're looking, hopefully, for a better, you know, tomorrow. But we're being cognizant and knowing and recognizing our truth. And I think that this world and this kind of place that we're in right now is putting people in a place of survival. It's putting them in a place of like thinking outside of the box because the things that we thought were guaranteed or were secure, the pandemic showed us. Nope half those things failed or could not survive. And so we have to figure out another way for us to be okay. And so that turns us into these hustlers and it turns us into these people that think outside of the box to create things. And so I think that's really where we are right now. People are looking for change. They want positivity, but we have to learn to spread love. We have to learn to see what's really happening. And we have to do what we need to do to protect ourselves because as much as we put weight on people that are in offices and places of change, it starts with us. It really does. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And and, and to me, in the last in, in the last little bit of with regard to uh, the state of the union, I, I'd like to see us a little bit move a little bit more educated. We're in a technology <laughs> age. It, it makes no sense for us to be still in the dark, uh, complaining about the man and so forth and so on. This is it, the movement is too great right now, and we we have too much. If you have a cell phone. You have the access to the world. I actually said this in a, a podcast earlier today. Um, there's no excuse. You know what I mean? People need to be more uh, more educated and move more methodically with uh, and, and evolve with the times. It's little kids right now that have cell phones that can pull up crap like at the drop of a hat. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So Absolutely. Not, being ignorant is not an excuse. And mm -hmm. I think that the, the with the weight of you carrying us is a cell with uh, with the weight of you carrying a cell phone, it should be the weight of you uh, exercising your 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 uh, political voice uh, mm -hmm. to, to to make change. Absolutely, I'm gonna add with that. Mm -hmm. 
Last question before we get you out of here, Kyle. What advice do you have for aspiring talent? People that want to be in a, in a position uh, to achieve like things that you have uh, accomplished. What are your thoughts? Man, I don't know what I've accomplished. I've just uh, survived. But um, no, advice for aspiring talent is to recognize who you are first. Know who you are. Know what you're willing and not willing to do so that when you walk into rooms and environments, you understand what your terms are. You have to also be willing to share your gifts with the room. So you, I say that in the sense of, and I want people to understand this, people as themselves are a gift. So when you go to audition for something or you go to share your talents, you are sharing a gift with those people. And you have to have that mentality so that you know there's really nothing for you to fear. You're sharing a part of you, and if they want that for their production or whatever it may be, then they'll bring you on. If they don't, oh, well, you move on with your life. And recognize that having the tools that are essential for your craft will better enable your stability in this industry. And those tools, meaning for an actor, a resume, a reel, uh, s s searching out or seeking out, I should say, um, representation, commercial, theatrical, you know, voice, whatever it may be that you want to work within. But having those things will be key. And letting your persistency come from the fuel of your passion. So don't ever stop doing what you're doing because if you're passionate about it, let that fire be within you to keep going. That's what would be my advice. And put God first, always. Uh. That part. <laughs> Uh, as Lisa Dove Washington says, your gifts are given to you to share with others. Fully agree. Uh, fully fully agree. wholeheartedly agree. Wholeheartedly Absolutely. Agree. All right. Well, lastly, uh, how can people learn more about you, brother? Like, how how can they reach out to you if they want to learn more, if they want to get acquainted with you, brother? Just to su support and substantiate everything that you that, that that you know that you're building on. How can people? Learn yeah. More? For me, it's easy. I am. I need to do better on my social media game, but I'm on social media like Instagram. Hit me up there. Kyle.jones1 is my Instagram. Uh, Love in Los Angeles for our actual web podcast show page is there. Um, Instagram is really easy. Um, you know, other access comes from me submitting things and projects, but those are the best ways to get a hold of me if you want to ask a question um, or talk about things or network and talk possibly talk about some business but those are the best ways for me and um i'm accessible i'm here i love the art that's why i'm an artist so this thing will not stop and i am looking forward to sharing and doing more with the world indeed thank you for sharing uh thank I'm you so to, much man of course of course i'm gonna run a, a quick message from my sponsor and then uh we are going to get back to it and then we'll walk our way out of this thing, okay? Hey, man, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. No problem. One second. Let's get there. Here we go. Yeah, check it out, man. It's your boy Akon. That's right. He had informed me to get ready for the Hit Lab Showcase. Welcome to Hit Lab, presenting the 2021's Digital Emerging Artist Showcase, the DEAS, an emerging artist competition with a fully digital application process, the first of its kind. Artists can submit their songs for digital analysis through HitLab's artificial intelligence DNA technology. Digital nuance analysis for the chance to showcase their song to a live audience and to win a professional recording contract with a major label. Upload your original songs, compete against the region's top artists, show your talent. Follow the Digital Emerging Artist Showcase. For more information on how to apply, submissions open soon. HitLab, where music meets technology. Yep, that's what it is. Hit Lab is dope. Uh, there's a lot more uh, involved with it, but if you want to learn more, feel free to hit me up and I'll explain it to you. It's just that simple. 
with regard to uh, you, Kyle, I definitely appreciate the time and, and and you know you know it's all love with with me and you, bro. Like you, you, my guy, man, for real. It's always gonna be that, no matter what. Um, you got any any just last shout outs? Anything you want to throw out there, real quick, and then we can get you up and get you going on about your baby. I just want to say thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, man, and just share any of my words of wisdom and knowledge with the world, man. I appreciate you. Thank you for the opportunity, man. And just uh, I really hope that you continue to do more and keep pushing to share your talents because you got it, man. You got a lot going on. And I, I hate that I ain't wearing something else. I should be wearing some hella fashion up in here for you. Wow. <laughs> Damn it. You got your you got your bison colors on there, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, a little, a little stronger. <laughs> no, <I'm playing>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotta throw out there again. Shout out to the lifers, man. Shout out to the lifers. That's my boy uh, D back home, man. This is uh, his line. Uh, he's yeah. a dope movement. Shout out to lifers. Shout out to uh, my boy Picasso's uh, apparel. Shout out to Eat back home. Like you know. DMV's coming up, man. It's just a lot of talent and a lot of people is coming up, man. You got talent, so, so forth and so on, like this brother Kyle here right now. Um, ba Nicholas Baker, my homie uh, from Two Flew West, man. Uh, it's just so much. Uh, uh, oh, and uh, Mo Better, uh, being the, the philanthropist genius that he is back home with uh, Santa Claus and, um, you know, giving, giving back to the community. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, and I got a brother pro. Uh, that uh, was with uh, Will Rafford Food. Uh, I'm going to be interviewing him on Sunday. Um, just it's it's so much in abundance, and it's really good to see. I'm thankful for all, everybody's energy, and all I could try to do is just lift uh, lift everybody up and put a shine a light in their direction because you guys deserve it. It ain't about me. It's about people seeing exactly what's out there, and um, you guys do the the, the 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 hard work for me. You know what I'm saying? So I appreciate you, brother Kyle. I appreciate, you know, everything that you do and, and your energy um, and just your, your humbleness, man. Just overall, man, you're, you're a great dude, man. And like I said, in 2020 was difficult. And I learned, if not nothing else, to celebrate people while you got them. And absolutely. You know, I, I absolutely celebrate you, brother. You are you're a phenomenal individual, man. Real life. You know, thank you, man. I appreciate you and your many talents, man. We got to give each other our flowers while we're here. Amen. Amen. Amen to that. Amen to that. You know, uh, I, I I would give flowers to the other HU, but I can't because I'm um, a part of the the, the real, the, you know, that HU. You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let me just go ahead and get yeah, off. Yeah, black me out. It's okay. It's okay. I, I I can be so petty with it, but we not. <laughs> but it's, but it's all love. So. <laughs> hey, look, it's all love. So, hey, look, it's all love. At all. HBCU stand up unite. I, 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 Mad shout outs, mad respects to, to to Howard University too. Mad shout outs to Hampton University, uh, all of the other HBCUs. Uh, you're not lost, and this year uh, proved it. You know, and at the end of the day, why are we bicking with each other? It's stupid. You know what I mean? So, uh, love, respect uh, each other. Um, I want to see everybody win. Um, sorry, a shout out to anybody who. Oh, sorry, Spellman. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, and Morehouse, uh, everything down in the, tri in the Atlanta Triangle, uh, and T, you know, if you're HBCU, uh, HBCU, HBCU, stand up. You know what I mean? Um, there you go. But as I was saying, uh, anybody affected by the snowstorm, um, you know, uh, reach out to me, let me know, and I I'll try to see if I how I can get you some aid. Uh, same thing with Two Flu West. Um, we, we'll do what we can to try to help out with aid and and, and strategize and and, and bigging, bigging things up. If you got a story to tell, hit me up. Pertaining to the, the entertainment industry, the beat is looking for it. If 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 it's anything else, the the Two Flu West is looking for it. So feel free to hit me up. My DMs, Donna B got the beats. Uh, you get us up at the, the Beat LA or Two Flu West, and uh, you already know what time it is. But Kyle, again, thank you, brother. Love you, man. And yeah, um, you already know what time it is, man. You got me on you got me on speed dial, so it is what it is, brother. Like any, any time. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, same same way, man. You got me. I'm easy to access, brother. You tap in whenever you need to. I appreciate you and you have a good night. Blessings, brother. Blessings. Indeed. And like I said, it's Donnie B got the beat sound off. You live on the beat. And sorry for the green shrubbery back here, the green giant, but we're going to get that fixed hopefully by the next the next joint. Oh, by the way, shout out to uh, 
uh, end quote, end quote. I will be uh, interviewing him on Friday at 2 p.m. That's another brother. Uh, is very fond of, uh, of us, uh, me and, and share friend with me and, and Kyle A. Jones here. Uh, dope, talented, mix engineer, uh, music producer, uh, entrepreneur extraordinaire. That's my guy, man. He's dope. Uh, so stay tuned uh, Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 2 p.m. Pacific Time. Also got All Pro All Day. Uh, that's my brother. Um, you know, uh, um, he's not a rapper. He shoot me for calling him a rapper. He's an entertainer and the founder of uh, What Rap for Food. Uh, in the DMV, uh, I'll have him on on Sunday. Next week, I got Lex Lou, uh, and uh, also um, shoot, I just got so many people right now. I, so if I'm drawing blanks, uh, I apologize to anybody. It's no disrespect, but. We move, man. Two flew west. Right. Uh, we have Cabana Black this Sunday too, um, six p.m. Eastern Standard Time, three p.m. Uh, Pacific Time. So, you know, I gotta keep it. I got all this head. I gotta keep that that, that calendar in there. You know what I'm saying? But uh, nonetheless, done with rambling. Kyle, any any last words? You know what? I want people to remember we need to spread more love. That's it. <laughs> the Appreciate you. Love and Los Angeles. Angeles, make sure you y'all tune in. Oh, sorry. Make sure that y'all tune in. Uh him and, and Tiana and uh support that 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 right there. Also, shout out to Ringo and Elfie, man. Uh the fam. Love those guys too. Um mm. and uh show your support. And uh like I said, mm. lastly, Donnie B got the beats. We live on the beat. Thank you for tuning in. Good night. Good night. Donnie, 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 Donnie.